All right, before I jump in, I want to do a couple of things. Number one is I want to point you forward two weeks to May 1st, uh, Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock. We're going to have another baptism celebration, and uh, that's what I like to affectionately call an all-skate event. That's where everybody is welcome to come and uh, celebrate with us, eat together, worship together as we celebrate baptism. And I also know that there are some folks, and maybe you're one of those who has said at some point, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, I know I'm a Christian, I've made that decision, uh, I've just never been baptized, and, and yeah, I, I hear about the baptism celebration, I just need to do it. Well, I want to encourage you, just do it. Um, just let, let's, let's make this happen on May 1st. Uh, so if you're somebody who's ready to be baptized and take that step, um, you can contact the church office, talk to Lynn Blunt. And she'll kind of walk you through that process. You know, I mean, if you're somebody who's just exploring faith, exploring the Christian faith, or um, you're kind of at a point of trying to make a decision about Christ, you just need some more information, you talk to somebody, please let me know. I would love to have that conversation with you. But um, just looking forward to that baptism celebration on May 1st. Okay, I spent uh, five days in Nicaragua. That's where I was this time last week. And um, it was a great experience and we've already sent several teams down who've come back and all have said the same thing what a tremendous experience it is what great ministry is happening in the church down there it's a church called Christ Our Rock Church led by Marvin and Gretel and um, they're doing uh, feeding programs for children leadership training uh, for leaders in the church and uh, lots of other amazing things all of which line up with our philosophy and, and mission of ministry here at Cornerstone and so one of the big reasons I was going down was to decide is this is this another partnership we want to make overseas in addition to what we're doing in Uganda and um, well I'll just go ahead and say yes we're going to do that but I'll get to that more in just a minute uh, let me do a little vacation slideshow here for you so let's show that first one so this is Marvin and Gretel and um, they lead the church there in Tippy Tapa and uh, they are tremendous leaders they have a, a young daughter we call her Gretel Jr. I guess that's okay, and we've been calling anyway. She's about 10 years old, I think, and and uh, she's wonderful. And and so when you go down there, you stay in their house, like they rearrange their house to suit the teams that come down there, just to give you an idea of how committed they are to this. And um, <clears throat> they just do a wonderful job. They're a tremendous team in ministry and ministry and everything that they do, and and uh, and they work hard at what they do. And um, it's nonstop, all the time, kind of a ministry situation. All right, let's go to that next picture. This is the church there, Christ Our Rock. This is uh, Saturday night was when they had the main service, and they asked me to preach. So folks are just kind of coming in and gathering there. And, and um, that's Juan right next to me. He was my translator. And um, he had just informed me that some changes would be made. So I'm scrambling with my notes to try to get that taken care of before I get up there. But that's okay. That, that's typical. That's kind of how that goes sometimes. And then this, is, uh, this next picture is me actually preaching there and Juan doing a phenomenal job of translating. And preaching through a translator is very, very hard. It's one line at a time, and uh, you can't quite get the flow, you know, like you normally do. And it's really hard to translate Alabama into Nicaragua and into Spanish. So, you know, I could hear Juan going, uh, 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 and then he would come out with it. So, but uh, we had some other folks say they did a phenomenal job. All right, in this next picture, um, they had a, a gathering of the children there in Tippy Top on Sunday night, and um, it's awesome, man. They bring all these kids in. Gretel does a bunch of games with them, and uh, they all have purpose. Every game has purpose. You know, they win prizes, um, and that was so much fun. And then uh, they get into this teaching time, and they were teaching on the story of Peter and John going to the gate and finding the lame beggar, and the beggar asked for money, and they say, well, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give you. Stand up and walk. And um, so he was recounting this story, uh, Marvin is, and see, I hadn't seen this side of Marvin the whole trip. He's Mr. Logistics. He's kind of focused on making sure the bus is going, this, this is happening, this is happening. Man, he was Mr. Drama in telling this story. It was absolutely hilarious. And when they started the story, they started it with this kind of a uh, little bit creepy Halloween music, like, you know, organ, dun, 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 you know. And Marvin's walking around going, <laughs> You know, and, uh, so I'm looking at Matt, who's down there from Atlanta, and I'm like, what do you think? And he's like, I don't know where we're going with this one. So we'll just see what happens. But that was just a way to get everybody's attention, get all the kids' attention. And then he jumps into this story and does this very dramatic rendition. And you can see, he's, I don't know, he's speaking Spanish. So I don't know how he said it. But he's jumping over, and he's speaking to himself. And then he jumps back over, and he's speaking to himself. And he's walking around. The kids are just locked in. And, um, and it was great. And afterwards, you know, they asked questions about the story, and kids got prizes, and it was really cool. 
But the thing that, that I love about this is look at that shirt that he's wearing. Where have you seen that shirt before? That's a Cornerstone Pebble Path shirt. And uh, so he's wearing that, and he's teaching these kids down here in Tippy Tapa, Nicaragua. And I'm just watching it, and I'm going, oh, man, it's so cool. It's just another way that we here at this church get to extend the mission into a place like Nicaragua. And, and it, it, it made me think about just Jesus' last words to his disciples, what we now call the Great Commission. Go, therefore, into all the world. Teach, baptize. And, uh, and this is like what's happening down there, you know. And this is another way that we get to extend this mission, this great commission, and, and to go there and, and to partner with them and the good work that they're doing. And so I got back, and our executive team here at the church met Thursday night, and, and I reported on what I saw. And they said, well, is there any reason why we shouldn't partner with them, you know? What's the red flag? And there really is none. And so they agreed unanimously to start a partnership in Nicaragua. So that's official now. We have two places overseas, Uganda and Nicaragua, that we'll be invested in. And um, the great thing about Nicaragua is it's a little bit different than Uganda. A, it's cheaper, which that doesn't hurt. Uh, it, it's also a three-and-a-half-hour flight as opposed to 14 to 18 hours on a plane. That's really nice. It was weird, man. I got on that plane. I had my, my Africa hat on. And three hours later, we're landed. I'm like, whoa, this is good. This is nice. Um, the time zone is the same, uh, except that there was a little bit of time difference because we changed times at spring break. They didn't. But, um, but there's no jet lag to get over. There, there's none of that that we normally have to get over in Africa. Now, I will say this, brothers and sisters, it's hot. It's like, it's 100 degrees every day. And um, so imagine it like this. You're down at Panama City, and you're, you're down there for a few days, and you spend a whole day outside, and then you get to go into the air conditioning. You go, man, I'm so glad to be in the air conditioning. You just don't get to go in the air conditioning down there. It's the same thing, just you don't get to go in the air conditioning, unless you ride the bus. Now, the bus has air conditioning, so we rode the bus a lot. Actually, several of them rode the bus a lot. You know, it's like, hey, why are you on here? No particular reason except it's air conditioning. So it was great, you know, and, and uh, the heat is not that big of a deal, but the rest of it is fantastic. It was just beautiful to be there with Marvin and Gretel. Um, you know, we have to have translators. It's all Spanish. And uh, if you're somebody who speaks Spanish and you're ready to go overseas, let us know. We'd love to have you as a part of that. But our next step is to start organizing trips. We'll be doing that very soon. So you'll be hearing about future trips that can be made down there and a way that you might want to get involved in that. So um, anyway, I'll have a couple more pictures later in the sermon to talk about a couple things. But just wanted to give you an idea of what was happening down there and how excited we are to be able to uh, have another place that God has brought us to. All right, I appreciate Lee last week kind of uh, talking through uh, this faith work series that we're in. He dealt with verses 13 through 18 of chapter 1 and just talking about the whole issue of temptation and how we handle that. And, um, you know, we're talking about the, the two things, faith and works, and how we make those happen in our life. And it's such a, you know, this picture that we have is this idea of our life should be rooted in faith, and because of those roots, we have this fruit, this top part that, that grows out of that, they called works. And we can't have one without the other. Those two things need to happen when it comes to our Christian life. And um, it's just a natural part of that. Today, the verses that I'm going to work through, uh, we're going to talk about do something. <laughs> you know, don't just have faith, don't just hear, but do something with what you have, what God has given you. So we'll be in James chapter 1, looking at verses 19 through 27. If you have your Bibles, you may want to go ahead and Go ahead and turn there, and we'll work through that um, together. Um, let me ask you a question, though, before we get going. Have you ever heard this phrase, or have you ever used this phrase, in one ear and out the other? Yes. Um, <clears throat> some parents might use that with their children. In one ear and out the other. Hey, would you mind cleaning up your room? Is there watch TV? Uh-huh. Hey, can you, you cut the grass today? Uh-huh. How about, can you make sure you take out the trash this afternoon? Uh-huh. Then later on that night, hey, did you get your room cleaned up? What? Clean up my room? I didn't even know I was supposed to clean up my room. Cut the grass? I didn't even know the grass needed to be cut. Take out the trash in one ear, out the other, right? It, it means it got in there, and they heard it. It just didn't translate into action, so it just went right out the other. It's just like it just went past right through. Or... 
Heaven forbid I should talk about spousal situations, especially gentlemen, us, when we're sitting in that chair. You know that chair, the one we sit in? It's not called worker boy. So there's that chair. And, and maybe she's trying to tell us something very important, and we're just, mm-hmm, uh-huh. And ladies, what I'm saying that you're saying is very important, but to us sometimes it sounds like wah, 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 because we're not listening. So then what happens is two days later when you say, hey, you remember when I told you, did you get that done? And we go, huh? Weren't you listening? Uh Uh-huh. Wah, 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 wah. In one ear and out the other. (laughs) You know, is this idea that it's one thing to listen. Well, first of all, it's one thing to hear. Then there's like another thing to listen and then another thing to do. You agree with me on that? There's like three levels of that. I heard you, I actually listened to you, and I'm going to do what you were talking about in that conversation. And that is so much of what James is talking about here just in terms of our faith and how we handle our faith. Is, you know, it's one thing to hear the word or hear God, but it's another thing to do what he calls us to do. So let's go ahead and and, uh, look at this, work through uh, verses 19 through 21. I'll call this first part just part one because he's kind of got two parts to what we're talking about today. So James says this, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So if I were to title this first part, I would call it how the word goes in. In other words, how we receive the word of God when we read this, the word that is planted in us that we hear just like we're doing right now. We're hearing this word. We should accept that in such a way that it begins to make changes in us. And so James then goes forward and he talks about, here's what that would look like. First of all, he says, we need to learn how to be quick to listen. Quick to listen. And specifically, and there's a couple of layers of meaning in here. The first layer is that he's saying we should be quick to listen to the word every chance we get. In other words, we need to put ourselves into places where we're hearing it Sunday morning. Small group. Our own quiet devotional times. Reading the scripture putting ourselves in a place to often hear the word spoken or read so that we can understand what it's saying. Quick to listen to the word of God so that it will change us. And then that next layer is just obviously we need to learn to be quick to listen in general. And see if you agree with this, that, you know, this day and age, it's kind of like listening is a discipline. You know, it's something we have to really learn to do, to sit and to listen to people long enough to genuinely hear what they're saying. We're so inundated with information and and things coming at us all the time that, you know, in in a way, experts would say that over the years, we we can only handle so much now as compared to to generations previous, we can only handle sound bites and, and chunks of information. We can't sit for a long time and take things in. But listening is such a key part of relationship. Someone once said, this guy named Zeno of Sidium, I don't know who he is, but he said something very smart. He said, we have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen more than we say. We have two ears and one mouth, you know. We should spend time genuinely listening so that we might understand. And, you know, the key to communication is not how much we talk to somebody, but it's how much we listen to them. And when communication breaks down, in any relationship that we have, it's usually because we're not listening well. And I am just as guilty of what I'm about to say as anybody else, but this happens often. When you get in the heat of battle and you're saying whatever it is you want to say, you know what sometimes I can do, and maybe you do this, is when, when somebody's talking, is I'm preparing my response. You know, I'm not listening for understanding, I'm thinking, when you get done, I got something to say, and it's going to end it, you know, <laughs> and, then you, and then you haven't heard a word they said, so that when you respond, it was the not right response, and now we're in a, another level of fighting, so 
you know, listening genuinely for understanding is so important to every single relationship that we have. And I think about our relationship with Christ that, you know, we can't hear what he has to say, A, if we don't spend time with him. But when we spend time with him, when we know him and he knows us, we hear his voice. And sometimes that's hard to do. So much coming into our head all the time. You know, it can get very noisy and very complicated. And I know there are times when I don't hear his voice as clear as I should, but that's the voice I want to hear. And Jesus said this in John 10, 27. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. My sheep, my genuine followers, they listen to my voice. Not all those other voices in the world. Not all those other things that everybody else is saying you should do and how you should live and how you should treat people. They listen to my voice. And I know them. It's like parents, if you put your child in a group of other children and you turned around and they started talking, you would pick them out, wouldn't you? You know their voice because you spend time with them. You're, you, you know who they are. You can hear them the same way with following Christ. So quick to listen. The next thing is that um, Jesus says, we, or, or James says, we should be slow to speak. Slow to speak. And again, he's going back to this whole taking in the word or what we do with the word that when we read the word, we should be slow to read it so that we might understand it. But then also, if we're going to do something like teach it, share it with another person, preach it, whatever it is, we need to be careful with how that comes out so that we do that accurately and compassionately and, and that we do that well. And so we should be slow to make that happen. But also, you know, that would be true in every part of our life, right? We have to be real careful with what we do with our words recklessly sharing our opinion. And boy, there are a ton of opinions going on these days. Good grief. In every realm of social media, it's just like one opinion after the other. But we have to be careful what we do with our opinion because sometimes our opinion can hurt somebody else if we're not careful. Or we may say a word that was not helpful to that other person or you know, whatever the case may be, if we just start firing things out of our brain, um, not good things happen usually. Proverbs 12:18. It says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Reckless words bring pain. But wise words, carefully spoken, can bring healing to somebody else's life. It's kind of like the principle of the toothpaste and the arrow. The toothpaste that gets, what's the word, squoze, squeezing, squoze-in? I'm not sure what the word is. Toothpaste comes out of the tube. Can you get it back in? Have you ever tried to get it back in? No. Once you've shot the arrow and it's heading toward the target, you don't get to run and go grab it before it hits the target, right? It's the same thing with our words. Once we have aimed our words at somebody and we have shot them or spoken them and they've heard it, there's no getting that back. The best we can do is come back and apologize and clean it up. But it would have been a whole lot better if we'd have been more thoughtful before we spoke them, if we'd have slowed down before we spoke those words. James is saying it would go a whole lot better in every part of our life. We would be wise if we would do that. We would be wise. And then the last thing is slow to become angry. <laughs> slow to become angry. Now again, to keep that verse in, in context, he's saying, look, when you read the Word of God, sometimes it's offensive intentionally. It's not politically correct, by the way. <laughs> the Bible's not that. It's offensive sometimes. And it calls us out. And it shows us our weak spots. And it tells us what to do and what not to do. And, and sometimes it can be offensive in a way that we don't like it, that we can get angry <laughs> at our children. you know. Anyway. But, but he would say, be careful with how you take that word in. Don't become angry at God because of what you've heard, because anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God wants in our life, is what he's saying. He's saying, be slow to that. In fact, probably never get to the point of anger. Some, some people would ask, well, is there any good anger? Yeah, I mean, Jesus was angry at times because he was angry at injustice. He was angry at wrong things. And so other than that kind, most of it is unproductive. And, uh, and in every area of our life, we have to be careful with anger, don't we? Letting it brew up and boil over, and especially when we're dealing with people Proverbs 14, 16, and 17, it says, The wise fear the Lord and shun evil, but a fool is hot-headed and yet feels secure. 
It's like, man, I can pop off anytime I want to. It's fine. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> you know, and there's casualties all over the place behind you, but, you know, it's okay for you. You're good. And then verse 17 says, A quick-tempered person does foolish things, and the one who devises evil schemes is hatred. Have you ever just popped off and gotten angry at somebody and that went well? Probably not. Um, I came across this little saying about this Cherokee that was talking to his grandson. I thought I would share it. It said, An old Cherokee told his grandson, My son, there is a battle between two wolves inside us all. One is evil. It is anger, jealousy, greed, resentment, inferiority, lies, and ego. But the other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, humility, kindness, empathy, and truth. And the boy thought about it, and he asked grandfather, Which wolf wins? And he said, the one you feed. The one you feed. And I was like, oh man, isn't that so true? When we feed anger and jealousy and resentment and bitterness and gossip and lies and all the other crazy things, we just let that grow in our life. And it will grow, trust me. The more you feed it, it's a beast that will grow. And it will damage relationships and it will damage your soul. Or you can feed the one that is good, that breeds joy and, and empathy and compassion and patience and, and all of these other good things in our life. And that will grow. And it will build relationships. And it can change the world. But we have to moderate. You know, we have to be careful with how we let things like anger get into our life. And let the word be planted in us so that it changes us. All right, well, let's go on to part two, verse 22. James says this, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So if I were to title the second half of this, it would be how the word goes out or what our response is to the word that we've taken in. How do we respond to it? James says, look, it's not enough just to listen to it because then if that's all you do, you've deceived yourselves. You've missed another part to this whole Christian life. But you have to, to do what it says. And he says it's kind of like looking in a mirror and forgetting who was in that mirror. Standing in front of a mirror and going, okay, I got that, and then walking away and a minute later going, ah, oh, I forgot what I look like. And you have to go back and you look at it again. Ah, oh, now I remember. You know, it's kind of ridiculous. In that day, by the way, I was thinking, what's the mirror situation 2,000 years ago? But in that day, obviously, they didn't have mirrors like we have. They all had little small, like 6 by 12 pieces of metal. Uh, most of them were copper and tin that were beaten and flattened and then polished. And then that was your mirror. And it, it didn't really have a, a great effect. Um, those who were wealthy had silver mirrors made out of solid silver pound those, polish them up so you could see yourself. And then the wealthiest of the wealthy had gold mirrors, and that produced the best reflection. <laughs> There's like a whole sermon in that, I'm thinking. Uh, but anyway, so those were kind of the mirrors that they had. So they all understood what it meant to get in front of a mirror and fix your makeup and adjust your, uh, not your hair. You, I mean, well, some people adjust their hair. I mean, you know, get it right, get it squared away. But uh, anyway, get everything checked out and then walk away. And so he's saying, look, it, it would be it, r ridiculous to walk away from that mirror and forget what you look like in the same way. It's just as ridiculous. If you read this word, you hear what it says, and you walk away from it and do nothing. And do nothing. If this book tells you what you should do and you walk away and do nothing, it's just as ridiculous, James is saying. We have to be careful to put the two parts of our Christian life together. In the, in the Psalms 119, 105, he said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Whenever we live by and read this word, it is showing us where to go, showing us how to live, how to proceed with our life. It shows us what to do. And the path of blessing is in doing the word. And it brings freedom to our life. It brings freedom to people who've been chained by anger and jealousy and resentment and bitterness and gossiping and lying, all these other things that, that keep us down. The word brings freedom to that if we will do it, if we will participate in it. And these last two verses in uh, chapter 1 are kind of random. Um, 
he says in verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. He's going back to the beginning of this and he's saying, look, the tongue is something, it can be, it can be good and uplifting and encouraging and do good things in people's lives or it can be absolutely dangerous and it can prove whatever's in your heart or whatever's not in your heart. Be careful what you do with your tongue. And we'll talk more about that later as he will talk about it in later chapters. And then verse 27, he says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. In other words, if you're somebody who is serious about your faith, your religion, and you trust in the Lord and you're following and obeying his commands, you will do something. You will do something. And then he mentions a couple of things specifically. You will take care of widows and orphans, which were a big, big deal in their communities in that day. Still an issue today, but certainly that was at the forefront back then. And he would say you would take your faith and you would take care of people. You would love people well. So in Nicaragua, um, we did several things while we were down there. And, and just kind of in light of this verse, uh, the first day that we were there, uh, we got to go out into the community and visit members of the church, of Christ Our Rock Church. And uh, Gretel was explaining to me that we're going to families who they all have issues in their life, some struggle, uh, something that's going on. And so she goes out to visit and pray with them, but also um, they're, they're just struggling for resources, very, very poor. And it's kind of like, golly, these are the poor talking about the poor. <laughs> so these are really poor. And, um, and so before we went out, uh, we went and bought bags of beans and rice and sugar and cooking oil. We went back to the house, we divvied them up, and we filled trash bags, one bag full of a bag of rice, bag of sugar, cooking oil, you know, bag of beans. And uh, we tied those up, got in the van, and started going out and visiting people. So we went to this lady's house first. Her name is Sarah, and um, with her children there. And um, we all introduced ourselves, and, and uh, Gretel kind of explained her situation. She doesn't have a husband there in the house, which makes it even more difficult as a family and especially if there are children involved and and so um, we were able to to hand her the food and Gretel kind of prepped that by you know Sarah we're bringing you this food it's a gift from God uh, just because we know that you're struggling we want to show how much we love you and and so we handed her the food very very deeply grateful <laughs> this is like a big day when food shows up in this way and then Gretel uh, shared a passage of scripture there's always the word as well as the, the food, there's these, these two ways of doing this kind of faith down there. There's always going to be the word and, and the food when it comes to feeding program. So she shares the word, and then we circled up, and then somebody on our little team prayed for Sarah and, uh, and blessed her. And, it, you know, it just reminded me, you know, how powerful it is to go to a widow like that, as we just read in James, and to make a difference in her life. And then another thing that we got to do, as I mentioned before, was the feeding program, and and uh, so we went up to a town called Wigalpa, which is um, Gretel's father is a pastor in Wigalpa. So we got to go up to his church, and we had the service, and when the service was finished, they cleared the chairs out, and then they put them in a big circle, and then they invite all the kids to come back in. And uh, they've got rice and beans and, and food in the back. It's already been prepared. Our team goes, gets the food, and, and begins to hand it to the children right there in the church. And, and uh, so they start eating, and then Gretel's sister comes over to me and a little group gathered there, and, she starts telling the stories of the kids that are in that circle. And she says, you see that little boy right over there with the gray shirt? She said, he has a very difficult situation in his life. His, he doesn't live with his parents. I think one parent died and one left or something like that. I'm not sure the situation. But he has to live with his grandmother who's very poor and can't provide for him. So the, the, the best thing he's got going is this church. He gets a good nutritious meal when he comes there and he gets people who love him who care about him, who want to make sure that he is clothed well and goes to school and all those kinds of things. And then she went over and she pointed to a little girl in a purple shirt. And she said, you see that little girl right there? She's a very similar situation in her life. She doesn't have very much going on. In fact, um, she broke her arm not too long ago, and they didn't have the means to, to get that taken care of. And so um, because of that, it, it, there's a bone that sort of grew out a little bit under that skin. And sure enough, when you looked at that arm, you could see where it had clearly been broken. And, um, and so that arm will stay stiff for the rest of her life, probably, unless she can somehow find a surgery to correct that. But, you know, and, it, and she just kept going around, children, child after child after child. And it hit me right then, this is why they do this. 
This is why this is so important because these kids, they need, they need hope. You know what I'm saying? They need hope. They need to know that there are people in this world that love them and that care about them. And how, how good is it when the church gets to do that? How good is it when we get to come in and say, you know what, young lady, young man, God loves you. We love you. We're going to prove that by helping you out right here in the name of Jesus. And that's all about doing something, isn't it? If they just stood up in that community and preached the gospel and closed the Bible and went back to their house, hearing the word would be good, but it, it may not change anybody's life. And sometimes for folks to hear the word, they have to, they have to see it first. You know what I mean? They have to see the word, see it done. And, um, you know, overseas missions is not just about what happens in that country. It's about how I'm changed when I come back here. That's what we always say. Go overseas, but let it change what you do back here. And I'm reminded that that word and what we did there is just as important right here in our community. It's just as important for your neighbor, my neighbor, for, for this place that we live. And this call, this challenge that James is giving us is for every single one of us. He's saying, look, don't be like the world. It's selfish. It's self-focused. It's in it for itself. Don't be like the world. Change the world. Change it. Make it more like Jesus. I'm going to leave you with this last thing. It's, it's uh, from John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. I thought it summed it up really well. He said, do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can in all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as ever you can amen let's pray well father we thank you for the the challenge that James has laid out to the followers of Jesus, not only back then, but to us today right here. A reminder to be good listeners. And Father, I've been just as guilty, but I think we've all been guilty at times of just not listening to you very well. To, to not hearing you above the noise in our life and to not slowing down enough to genuinely take in, A, how much you love us, and B, what we're supposed to do. So, Father, I pray that we would continually learn to slow down, to take time, to read your word, to open our ears to hear your voice every single day so that not only we will be changed, but that we can bring change into this world. And, and so, Father, I pray for that for all of us. I pray that we would be doers of the word, not just hearers that we would go out into our places of business and, and at home and the ball field, wherever we are, and, and bring the light of Jesus into this world with anybody and everybody we can to do all the good that we can while we are here on this earth for your glory. So God, we thank you for that. We thank you for giving us the means to do that. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. By him, we know salvation. Through his resurrection, we have the power to live the life that you've called us to live so that we can allow the works to grow out of our faith. And Lord, we need that. We need you. We need you. And so God, this morning, we, we bow the knee, we lay down our lives once again, and we say, do with us as you will, Father. And we will obediently follow. We pray this in the strong name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ.